Uh, I think uh, I mainly use metaphors to describe how to not think about the future. One kind of uh, future thinking that I think is wrong is the railroad analogy. It's this idea of a sleek modernist train on a railroad track, it's just taking off from a station, you, you better jump on it, and then it's going to be accelerated onwards through the landscape, and past uh, the small nanotechnology hill, past the biotechnology forest, towards uh, the glorious tunnel through the Singularity Mountains. And the problem with this metaphor is, of course, that it assumes the future is something linear, it's something that we need to jump onto, but there is no steering. We're not going anywhere but our destiny, whatever is at the end of that railroad track. The problem is, is in general, of course, that people like that because we mostly feel we don't have control over our own future. And especially technological change is something that just seems to happen magically. But in practice, when you study the history of technology, you find that people invent stuff for personal reasons. And what technologies get accepted or not in society depends on a lot of random chance, some of uh, economic forces which are quite irrational. It's a complete mess. It's not so much a single railroad track as a kind of whole uh, yard of them branching off and the switches are flipping more or less randomly. So it might be better to say that we might have this fan out of railroad tracks and we really don't want to get out on the left edge where we all fall down into a ravine. And we ideally would like to go on that rightmost track that leads to that really glorious beach in the long run. Except that in the most likely we're going to end up somewhere in the middle. The problem with most people's thinking about the future is that they tend to think that the future is like the present but with flying cars. So we add a few things and regard that as the future. We don't recognize that it can be drastically different. So these tales, typically people just express in utopian, dystopian terms, but we think that these tales can be much wider, much stronger. And things can go much more worse than people normally think. And they can probably get much better than people normally think. Now, when you start thinking about the future like that, you realize that you can need about three scenarios. You need the, well, middle of the road. The future might actually not be terribly different. A lot of these radical predictions have been wrong in the past, and a lot of radical predictions are going to be wrong in the future too. But we better prepare so if everything breaks down, we can save something. And we also prepare, can we actually push things in towards the really good side? Realizing that there is so much at stake, that's important. Another metaphor I like to think about is also about science as a labyrinth. We're kind of exploring, we're standing in a spot and we can move in different directions. And we're trying to get through this labyrinth, get further away. The problem is we don't have a very good sense of where we are. We can't look over the hedges or walls in this labyrinth. Um, but we can get a feeling of what kind of labyrinth is. Do the tunnels tend to follow regular patterns? Are different parts of the labyrinth similar? There are some parts uh, of uh, the science that seem to have regularities that we understand. Mathematicians seem to have some knowledge about what's going on in their own domains, although their intuitions don't work well outside. Physicists classically tend to assume everything boils down to a few simple principles that can be applied, and that's why they uh, always have hubris when we go into biology or economics. They think, oh, there must be some simple principle at work. And sometimes that hubris pays off. We actually do find something simply because we're looking for a simple principle. But quite often things are just complicated because it's a complicated world. A lot of the features of our world and our biology are just historical. It's a bit like the boundaries in Europe. Some of that has been set by mountains and rivers, but a lot of it was who was married to whom and what noble family owned what land. They're con historical contingencies. The fact that we have five fingers was because an ancestral uh, fish-like organism had five, uh, fi uh, f uh, five ribs in their fins. And then it's been kept on. Uh, so we can't expect those things to be universal. But we do tend, to, of course, to think that since the world is like it is right now, it must be some deep, profound meaning by, uh, by that shape. So I generally think that uh, the future, the best way of making the future good is to add more brains to it, have more intelligence. Because intelligence in many ways is a form of moral enhancement. Because if I can predict the consequences of my actions better, if I can understand better what other people will do when they hear this, and I can control my own actions better, that's going to be generally useful. But we need to do this in a lot of different domains, in a lot of different ways. So in the long run, we're going to need an awful lot of trial and error because we're not smart enough yet. And I don't think any intelligence in the universe is ever going to be fully smart enough. There's always going to be uncertainty and mistakes. 
So we need trial and error. We need to be open to take risk and invent stuff and see, does this work? In some domains, we need to be very, very careful because it's dangerous things we're playing around with. But in many domains, actually, we have full freedom and we should really embrace that freedom. Thank you.